It makes little difference whether we are going to look at a ferrous base material or a non-ferrous base material. We always have to confront the equilibrium phase diagrams to get some idea of what the microstructure will be <coughs> in the material that we are going to consider. The question has been asked, how do properties vary as you go across the composition, say, in the phase diagram? There's sort of a general rule of thumb that you can use to see how the properties will vary. And it goes something like this. If, if you have an equilibrium diagram that is a solid solution type diagram, so that at one end we have, let's suppose, nickel, and at the other end we have copper, the melting point of nickel is much higher than copper, but they produce a solid solution series looking like that. We have complete liquid state up here and a complete solid state down here, both being solutions, one solid solution and one liquid solution, and a mixture in between of solid plus liquid. Now let's suppose we were interested in how the ultimate strength of this particular material varied as we moved across this diagram. If we have diagrams of that type, what generally happens is we have, let's suppose we are examining the UTS, ultimate tensile strength, as a function of the composition between nickel and copper. We would find that we would have a curve that would look something like that. That says that the, there is a composition midpoint between the two where the ultimate tensile strength will be higher than the strength of either the nickel or the copper. Now what we're really talking about is a law of mixtures. Does the law of mixture predict that we would have a linear relationship between the two? Generally, if we have a solid solution, we do not have a linear relationship. On the other hand, if we have an equilibrium diagram that looks like this, a just simple eutectic diagram, whatever the components, let's say a component A and B, and I'm interested in how the property would vary across that, Again, let's just look at the UTS. If we looked at the UTS now, we'd find that if this is the ultimate strength of A, and that's the ultimate strength of B, then it's almost always a simple linear relationship going from one side to the other. Well, the law of mixtures is linear law. <coughs> if you put the two together, if you have a diagram then that looks like this, and let's suppose so I can use it later on, I draw a real diagram that will look something like this, which actually is the diagram for lead and tin. We would find that up to this particular point, we have a solid solution. And up to this particular point, we have a solid solution. This side being alpha solid solution, and this side being beta solid solution. And so in the solid solution fields, the, if this was the, where the ultimate tensile strengths, this for pure lead, then this is going to vary, and this one is going to vary. So we get curves that look something like this. And it's linear in the eutectic part of the diagram, and in the solid solution part of the diagram, there'll be some conic section. So rule of thumb, we can say that the properties do not have to be lin linear unless it's a, a mixture. If it's a solution, then the law of mixtures, the linear law of mixtures is not going to apply. Well, <coughs> I'd like to talk to you about non-ferrous materials, and I'd like to talk to you about a whole array of non-ferrous materials, and I'd like to do this in in a way I think that might be entertaining to you. Uh, and first of all, I would like to say,
talk about a TV show. Like, I'm sure everybody watches at least one cowboy TV show in a lifetime. And you must have seen the TV show where a cowboy goes into the bar room and he throws a coin up and orders a drink and the old bartender picks it up and bites on it. Has anyone ever seen that? Do you know why he does that? Why does the bartender bite on the coin? Now, now let, let's be realistic. That bartender probably didn't even get into the second grade. And here you are, you know, well-educated, graduate engineer or whatever. Do you think if I gave you a coin, you could bite on it and tell the percent gold? Well, I'd know if it's, whether it's gold or not, perhaps. Because By biting? Gold is very ductile and malleable. Uh, suppose that it has been coined and is cold work. It's kind of hard. The, the strain hardening coefficient of gold is very high. So, so, what else? You know, actually, if we could just measure the hardness on a material and tell what it was, we wouldn't put all of these fancy chemical analysis situations out in labs to find out what the metals are. We just put <coughs> hardness machines, and we can't do that. So why else do you think he would bite on it? Well, I don't know. You, you could guess. And I really don't know, but I think I know. And the reason is because... Uh, he wanted to find out if it was counterfeit. And I happen to know that if you gave me, say, a Kennedy silver half dollar and said, Pon, I want you to make me a hundred of those by tomorrow this time. Now, I can do that so easy, it isn't funny. I'm going to tell you how to do it in a later lecture. But I, I don't do that, by the way. It's against the law, right? You're, you're not allowed to do that. But I know how to do it. And what I do is I just make a, a plastic Paris mold a piece mold, and I would cast in it tin, because freshly cast tin looks exactly like sterling silver. And now I can make a coin that looks like silver. But why does the bartender bite on it? Because this particular metal will talk to you. He will say something to you. If you bite it, it says, ouch. It squeals. Well, I have here a bar of freshly cast tin. Now, on this side, it should look to you, if you examine it closely, just like a piece of sterling silverware that you'd have on your table. Beautiful, beautiful material, just a, a beautiful piece of tin. If we looked at it on the other side, we find that it's kind of frosted in the middle, right here. And actually, if you were as close to it as I am, you could see that what I really have here are the dendrites in relief, just like we had in the galvanized coating that we talked about yesterday. So this is just a bar of tin that's been cast solidified and in the, the last material to solidify was in the very center and we ran out of material and therefore it made all of these little dendrites which look like a frosty section here. M maybe I ought to tell you something else at this stage in the game because you learn an awful lot of metallurgy by playing games with things that you touch every day. And so for instance you watch airworms to find out about solubility in the liquid and solid state. <coughs> But you can find it an awful lot about solidification if you, say, eat ice cream. Now, I, I would like to suggest an experiment to you. When you, next time you eat ice cream, uh, use a stainless steel spoon or a metal spoon. Before you start eating it, lick it clean and shove it in your mouth and get it uh, loaded with saliva. And that's a perfectly sanitary experiment. Nobody's going to touch it but you. You turn it bowl down in the, in the ice cream. Don't let any ice cream get over the side. And you just watch it. And all of a sudden, you'll see a frost film go sweeping across the bowl of the spoon. And, and do you know, if you, and the reason you see it, by the way, is because of the little dendrites that are growing. They break up really light, so it didn't reflect it from the bottom of the spoon. But do you know, if you measured that rate, you, you could write a paper, you'd be the first person to ever record the solidification rate of spit. <laughs> well, I know that such things happen. We get all these shrinkage things that are there, but I have the coin now, and it looks like a piece of sterling silver, and I say, all right, I'm going to take this particular material now and deform it, and I want to hear it say, ouch. So you listen. I'll let the tabletop serve as a sounding board, and I'll just bend it. You think that's my arthritis, don't you? It, it really isn't, you see? You can hear it from where you sit. Sounds like it's breaking. 
but it isn't breaking. And do you know what's really happening in this piece of non-ferrous material, this piece of tin? It is twinning, because twinning is one method of plastic deformation. And what happens now when this twinning noise goes on, what's happening inside the metal is, I have a crystal of metal which I elastically deform. I shove it over to one side. It's just like pushing on a book and you get the book to go over part way and it'll sit there. You know, you take your finger off, it goes back elastically, right? If you continue to push it more and more and more, you finally get to a point where it just goes boom and it falls over, right? It's past its point of equilibrium. In the tin crystal, we keep pushing on it until it gets to a non-equilibrium position and then it flips over all of a sudden. You know, you can almost do this in an, in an analog that I think you understand. And let, let's suppose I'm in an elevator shaft. And let's suppose an elevator comes along and hits me on top of the head and mashes me down to about that high, right? Now, do you think I'm going to... It stopped. It didn't kill me, right? But do you think I'm going to stand like this all day? No way. Why not? Because I'm a little bit narrower this way than I am that way, right? So I'm going to flip over and relieve the strain. Take the pressure off my head. If you take the piece of tin, it has a long crystal axis relative to a short crystal axis. And so if you squeeze on it, and it's oriented properly, then it says, hey, I don't have to put up with this noise and it, of this effort. And so it flips over, and it flips over so fast, it breaks the sound barrier in the tin. So what you hear is a manifestation of a shock wave in the tin. Or at least that's what I think. Well, uh, this particular material, tin, we don't have much of in this country. We use a lot of it in this country. Uh, we use it for a lot of different reasons, and uh, I want to tell you about some of them. Now, I just sketched out a little diagram, which is the lead tin diagram. <coughs> Lead's a non-ferrous material also, but actually, <coughs> if we look at this particular diagram, where we have uh, lead on this side, and tin on this side, we find out, and a eutectic here, we find out we have something that's called the solder series, the solder series, or we solder with this material. But we see that we have a eutectic that has a very low melting point, and we see that we have this non ferrous material, lead, capable of absorbing an awful lot of tin, up to about 20% tin, in fact, you can put in the lead. And you get materials that are so serviceable to us that we've picked up all sorts of names for the material. And we know them by those names whether we know what the elements are in it or not. And, and so, for instance, there's a material called plumber's solder. A plumber's solder is a solder that sits in this part of the diagram, just beyond this 80-20 point. And what we have is a material that has a long range of being a mixture of liquid plus solid, solid. And it was called that because in the early days, plumbers used to wipe joints, leaded joints. They would take a, a piece of canvas in their hand, they'd take two pieces of, of pipe, two pieces of lead pipe, put together, swell one swollen end over another piece, they'd pour the molten lead tin solder over top of it and catch it in their hand down below on that piece of cloth. And then they'd wipe this slushy, this mixture of crystals, back over the top, and it would keep melting the ends of the pipe and wiping it back over until it had this swollen section in the middle, it was called a wiped joint. But the plumber needed a big melting range to do this. And so we call that material plumber solder. It's still called plumber solder, and we don't wipe joints anymore. <coughs> or you could move to the other end of the diagram, move over in this particular section, and you find you have a material which is very much discussed and very much saved or looked after because it's a material that's called pewter. 